So I'd just like to welcome everyone here tonight. My name is Ed Zamora from Principia Prep, and today we're going to be going over the college aid process and how the whole college process works and so on and so forth. Now, today we're going to be going over the entire admissions and financial aid process, essentially from the cost basis of how the college process works. Both of these things, admissions and financial aid, have kind of overlapped each other with everything going on in the world here. I'm also going to be going over student loan forgiveness, which is obviously a big thing now, explaining to you guys how it works to see if you guys are eligible and how you can check if you're eligible, as well as the SAT, ACT optional situation and how it affects financial aid. Also, I'm going to be going over, obviously, the financial aid forms, the FAFSA, the CSS profile, as well as state of New Jersey's form, and the new programs out there specifically for the state of New Jersey here, such as the Scarlet Guarantee, which provides, in many cases, free college tuition for students looking to go to Rutgers, as well as me discussing places to go to help you guys avoid the scams and the frauds and everything else that's out there, as well as I'm going to talk about the student loans available to you guys when your students start college, as well as, of course, other financial aid off, uh, resources like scholarships and so on and so forth. And with that being said, let me start off with obviously talking about the first thing here, which is our new scholarship program we started last year. Last year, we were able to give out to senior class over uh, 12 scholarships to uh, seniors going out to college. So if you are looking for scholarship consideration or scholarship help, obviously, which is one of the reasons you guys are probably here, I would suggest obviously looking up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, our James Russo Memorial Scholarship. Every scholarship is basically $1,000 we give out to students going off to college. It's only eligible for students in senior year. We are going to basically keep trying to do this every year to help you guys out there, which basically brings me to essentially the, the, the way you guys can go to kind of see the James Richard Moore Scholarship. As you can see here on the screen, if you go to our YouTube channel, all you need to do is go to YouTube, type my name in, Ed Zamora, and you'll be able to see that we have a multitude of different uh, videos out there. We have now, I believe, 175 different college videos out there about basically everything out there. We talk about more in depth, the Scarlet Guarantee, which is a free Rutgers tuition. We talk about how to read a financial aid award letter, what should be on there, what should not be on there. We talk about different loan processes. We also talk about appealing scholarships, we appealing grants, how to do it properly, how to go out and get more scholarship money, all the websites that matter, which ones don't, how to basically establish in-state residency outside of the states for different colleges to reduce your costs. So we have a lot of videos on here. So if you go on to the YouTube channel, you'll be able to see that. And all you need to do is just type in the word Ed Zamora in YouTube, and you'll be able to see basically our videos. And what I'll do for you guys here is I'll make it very simple. I'll actually go to YouTube here. You guys can all see my screen still, correct? If you guys can still see my screen, just raise your hand. Okay, good. So we see here I'm on YouTube. All I need you guys to do is just go here to the address bar, just type in Ed Zamora, like this here, very simple. You click on Ed Zamora, and then what you see is it'll pop up basically all the information about our um, programs and different videos we have. As you can see here, the last video we posted here, by the way, it's our two-year-old. He's in like every video, if you're wondering. If you can see here, the last video I have is about what seniors should be doing right now. It literally just went out like two hours ago. I also talk about student loan fraud and a whole bunch of other things down here. So I have a lot of videos for you guys out there about it, basically everything. But what you guys can do besides going on here and watching the James Russo Memorial Scholarship, the best way you guys can help us is if you type in my name in YouTube and you click right here, which brings you to essentially our channel. I'll just stop this right here before it starts here as far as the introduction of what our channel is and what it does. If you go to this channel here and you guys go down a little bit here and just click on the play all button down here, this right here helps our organization out the most because the more videos you guys play, the commercials in the videos, that's what pays for the scholarship fund. So if you guys go on and watch any of these different videos we have on here about everything college-related admissions, financial aid, SAT optional, we have everything on here. If you go on here and watch the videos, if you let the commercials run, I tell parents all the time, if you want, you can basically be like the 80s. You can just let the commercial run and go to the bathroom or go get, grab a drink, you know, the way we used to do in the 80s when the commercials came on TV. You can, if you do that, just let the commercial run. That's what helps fund the scholarship program. Now, the best way to help us other than watching the videos for your own content to get more information for you guys and letting the commercial run is if you go here and press on the play all button, you can just let the videos run. I've had parents call me the next morning. Hey, Ed, I watched 60 videos. I watched 70 videos. I know you didn't watch a single video. I know what you did was you went on here, you pressed the play all button, and then just went to sleep and let the videos run, which is, believe it or not, the laziest but most effective way of helping us because that provides a ton of video watch, which provides a lot of commercials, which provides a lot of funding for the scholarships. And that's how we pay for all the scholarships, by the way. So let me bring it back here. Now that I kind of gave you guys an overview of all that. So obviously, if you want more college content, 
go on YouTube, type my name in, a lot of videos out there for you guys. If you want to help out with the scholarship fund, obviously go on here. The scholarship fund video is on here. As well as if you go on here and press the play all button, that helps us out tremendously. And with that being said, let's jump right into student loan forgiveness, which is obviously a huge thing. So big, we actually have, I think, eight or nine videos just on this specific topic, five of which came out in the last two weeks, okay? Obviously, a lot of you have heard about the student loan forgiveness that just came out and are wondering, are we eligible? Are we not eligible? One of the latest videos I have is basically loan companies coming out and trying to scam you guys. And this is what I mean by scam you guys. The way the student loan forgiveness works is you cannot take out any loans going forward after July 1st of 2022. So if you have no loans established for your students, you are not eligible for student loan forgiveness. That's number one. So anyone telling you they can establish you or they can get you accredited, accredited for the student loan forgiveness, it does not work that way. You either have federal student loans from July 1st, 2022 and before, or you don't. There's no adding loans now. You're not going to be eligible. Also, when it comes to student loan forgiveness, it's if your student makes after graduating $125,000 or less as a single individual, they're eligible for at least $10,000. If they're married and between them and their spouse, they make $250,000, they're eligible for federal student loan forgiveness. If at any point in time your student had received Pell Grants, federal student loan Pell Grants from the federal government by filling out the FAFSA form, then you guys are eligible for an additional $10,000. So $10,000 to start, $10,000 more, so a total of $20,000. Now, if you're unsure about how this whole program works, and also if you're wondering, if my student's already in school and they're still in college, do they count for student loan forgiveness? And the answer is yes. They don't have to have graduated to be eligible for federal student loan forgiveness. What they would need, though, instead of the student's income that counts because they're in college, they use the parent's income. So then your income has to be as parents if you're filing together, married, under 250. If you're filing single because you're divorced, widowed, or separated, or never married, then it's the 125 for the parent and below. But if you guys aren't eligible, no one can make you eligible. If you're still unsure, you can obviously watch our videos, or if you go on studentaid.gov, on studentaid.gov, if you log in as the student, it will show you how much you have in student loan for loans out there from the federal government, the federal direct loans. And it'll also show you if you've ever gotten Pell Grants to see if you're eligible for the 10,000 or the $20,000 max, okay? And with that being said, let's start talking about some of the big changes here. When it comes to the FAFSA form, Right off the bat, the FAFSA form has had major changes this specific year that are going to be happening. Starting October 1st, by the way, all financial aid forms become available for seniors out there, for seniors in high school. If you're a junior parent or below, you're not doing anything. This is all information for you guys, nothing to do for you guys as far as paperwork. Now, starting October 1st, when all the forms become available for the senior parents, you guys will be going from a FAFSA that has typically 100, 110 questions down. It's being shrunk down around 50 questions. So it's basically be cut in half the amount of questions they're going to ask you guys. In addition, some of the things that are being taken away are not beneficial, but they're being taken away. Unfortunately, we have to talk about them. First thing that's being taken away is the parent's asset protection. Let me explain what that means. On the FAFSA form last year and going back, parents were giving a certain amount of money that did not count towards the cost of college that was in your checking, your savings, investments, stuff outside of retirement. What happened was this year, this October 1st, starting October 1st, 2022, going forward, anything you have as far as checking, savings, investments outside of retirement automatically starts counting. So there's no buffer here. There's no basically amount, small amount they're going to allow you to not count, unfortunately. So anything you put on these forms will count from dollar number one. That's a big change. Second big change here is if you guys had multiple students in college in previous FAFSAs, basically last year's FAFSA and going back, they would divide whatever you're supposed to pay for one student based on the family's financial situation in two, if you had two students. If you had three students going to college, divided by three. That's also getting rid of on board thing. And then another situation that's changed this year, they haven't implemented it just yet, but they have been talking about it. They've kind of been using all their time on the student loan forgiveness front, but the, the third the big thing here that's changing or looking to change is if you're divorced or separated, what typically happened with the FAFSA form was they would ask you, which parent does a student live with? And then once you indicated they live with mom or once you indicated they live with dad, then the other parents' information, their income and asset questions were erased. That is still going to happen. Only difference now is what they're talking about doing, and no one knows what yet they're going to do because they haven't opened the form yet. They're looking to very likely, unfortunately, change that from where you get to choose who the parent is 
based on where they live, specifically 51% of the time or more, to the parent that claimed them on the 21 tax return. Because going forward for senior parents here today, you guys will be using 2021 tax returns for all financial aid forms. The FAFSA, which is a starting form for everybody, the CSS profile, which is an additional form required by certain private colleges, as well as the state forms, which we'll be talking about. So all seniors, we're using 21 taxes, which means for juniors on the call, the 22 taxes the year we're in right now, that's the year you guys will be using for your senior year next year when your FAFSA opens up after October 1st. Now, when it comes to the FAFSA, I would not be doing the FAFSA the first week. I would hold off for a few days because every year, by the way, crashes in the first year. So you do not want to do it on the first day. You want to give it at least a four or five day wait period. Let everyone else jump on there, crash the site as much as they want, and then start the FAFSA. So there's no rush here. There's no prize. If you do the FAFSA form October 1st or the end of October, you all get the same money, by the way. And everyone always wants to know, well, what's the deadline here for these financial aid forms? And it's very simple. The FAFSA form is available since October 1st, and you have until February 1st to get the form done. You have all those months. No matter what month you fill it out, you get the same amount of money. Same thing with the CSS profile. Same thing with the state forms. You have months and months, October 1st to February 1st. The only time you have to do it earlier than that is if you're doing early decision one, nothing else. Early decision one, not early action, not restricted early action, not regular, not rolling. There's a few more I'm not going to talk about, but only early decision one requires you do the financial aid forms, the FAFSA and the CSS if you need to, and the state forms by the deadline of the early decision one, which is typically November 1st to November 15th, depending on your college. That's the only time, by the way, you have to form early on. But I would still not do it the first week. I'd give it at least two weeks, if not more, because the site constantly crashes in the first week, unfortunately. And with that being said, there's obviously a question out there. A lot of parents are wondering, you know, October 1st is when we start. So what do we need to get ready to start filling out these questions? But the reality is October 1st is not the first time you guys have been asked about financial aid questions for your students going off to college. Here on the common application is the first time you guys have been asked questions about financial aid. And you guys have been asked this question since August 1st, believe it or not, before senior year even started. The way this works is if you look on the common application or the coalition or any of the admissions forms, by the way, they all start asking the same question now, which is the question down below highlighted in blue. Do you intend to apply for need-based aid? And almost every parent asks me, Ed, why is the admissions office asking us if we're applying for need-based financial assistance? Why does the admissions office want to know, are they using this against us, basically? If we say, yes, we need financial assistance, is it a hindrance to our acceptance? And the answer is yes and no. By the way, I have a video more in depth about this. But if you want to know, does it hurt you or does it not matter at all? Very simple. Call the admissions office and ask them, is your school need aware or is your school need blind? If they say their school is need blind, they don't care if you say, yes, we need financial aid or not. If the school is need aware, they do use your ability to pay for the college as part of the process of accepting you to that university. So it is something to consider in the back of your mind. And of course, there's always a parent's asked, well, if we indicate no, we're not going to ask for financial aid, does it help us get in? And the answer in most cases is it does not help you get in, believe it or not, even for the schools that are looking for financial assistance from this perspective. The schools that are need aware are a very small group. You're talking about maybe two to three percent of all the colleges out there, over 40,000 plus colleges out there. So you're talking about a handful of colleges to begin with. Number one. Number two, they don't use it automatically up front. So if you're looking to do early decisions somewhere and they say they're need aware, they're not going to just pull your file and say this student wants aid. We're not going to look at them as an option here. Not the way it works. It typically works where they are down to the last couple of spots. Let's say they have 10 spots left. They have 100 students to review. Then they're going to say, no, who's looking for aid, who's not? That's typically when it affects you guys. So it doesn't usually affect you in the front end. So if you are looking for aid, I always tell parents, if you want aid, you need help, ask for the assistance. Do not consider putting no here unless you've done the net price calculator and you know you're not going to get any aid here. Then it's okay to say yes. Well, then it's okay to say no, we're not applying for aid whatsoever. And I'll show you guys what the net price calculator is in a moment. So it's a very important tool you guys will need to utilize throughout this whole process. Which brings us to the SAT-ACT situation. Now, when it comes to SAT-ACT, 
If your student is considering taking the SAT ACT optional route, let's call it for juniors uh, and even for seniors on the call here, the first place I would go is this website right here, fairtest.org. Down below is the entire website link here. You basically take a snapshot if you want to the screen here, obviously. On here, it shows you a list of over now 1,800 SAT, ACT optional colleges, which do not need the SAT or ACT for acceptance into the university. So if you're considering going that route, there's still a ton of colleges out there. I know most of the Florida schools have gone back to the SAT, ACT requirement. So has Tennessee and Kentucky and a few other colleges out there. A lot of schools, the whole basically University of California system is staying SAT, ACT optional for another couple of years here. So there are schools out there just in case. There's also high level schools that were SAT optional before the pandemic, like George Washington, American, uh, Fairfield, Marist, a lot of name brand schools out there. So if you are students not able to score well on a test, I would consider looking at the SAT, ACT optional situation. And this, by the way, in many cases does not hurt your financial aid opportunities for scholarships. Most schools will not use this against you for scholarship consideration if they are SAT, ACT optional and you go SAT, ACT optional. Now, you might be considering, well, will it hurt us admissions wise? And the answer is also no, it will not. If you don't send the test scores in, it will not hurt you, believe it or not, because the schools have already done this for a couple of years now. And most of them shown that they're still going to bring in the same kind of student, whether you take the SAT or whether you don't take the SAT. Okay, which obviously brings us to the cost of the college. Now, when it comes to the cost of colleges, they've obviously become very expensive, unfortunately. As you can see down here, the average public university, you're looking at a cost of roughly around 20 to 35 grand. All in, by the way, room, board, books, the whole thing. If you're looking at a private school, you're in the 40 to 60 range. And then the elite colleges have now exceeded the $90,000 price tag, believe it or not. It's gone insane as far as a cost perspective is concerned. In fact, if you look here, the average or I guess the starting price now for a lot of the private universities is 70 to 80,000. That's like the new norm, unfortunately. I know it sounds insane. It's normal, but that's the new normal. As you can see here for the senior parents and the junior parents, believe it or not, some of these schools, especially the higher end top schools here, the three at top, these schools will be $90,000 or more within the next year or two. Because most schools increase the price of their of, of everything, room, board, cost, extensions, et cetera, by anywhere from three to six percent every year. So obviously a six percent increase to any of the eighty thousand dollar colleges will put you pretty close, if not over the ninety thousand dollar number. Now, the reason I show you guys these numbers right in the get-go is to basically scare you into two things. Number one, to keep listening to me and, and watching this uh, webinar here. And number two, to let you know that those schools at the top are also some of the most generous colleges out there. Believe it or not, many of the schools on this list here on the high end, most of the students attending these colleges pay less than 50% of the starting price or the total cost of attendance. So the worst thing you can do, by the way, is look at the cost of the school and assume you can't afford it and then decide not to apply. Don't do that. What you need to do is the homework to figure out is the college affordable for us as a family. So the starting price in many cases for you guys is irrelevant to be honest with you. And let me explain to you guys, let me kind of go through how the homework works here. Now, when it comes to the homework, right at the bat, the first thing you guys have to understand is what is financial aid? And let me break it down for you. Because most families, when they think the words financial aid, they think grants and scholarships, but that's not what financial aid actually means. Financial aid from an institutional, a college person like me who's worked in a college, looks at financial aid in four categories. Financial aid means scholarships and grants, yes, the free money, but it also means loans and work programs. So if you keep using the term financial aid at open houses, college fairs, when you're sitting down with the admissions office and so on and so forth, what you guys will realize is that the college will keep saying to you, yes, there's financial aid available at our college for you without knowing anything about you financially, academically, or anything in between. What you need to do is when you're talking to college, since most families want to know about the specific scholarships and grants, what you need to say is, okay, that's great. You guys give out financial aid because we're starting to talk about financial aid here. But I want to specifically talk about the gift aid portion. Gift aid means, it's a financial aid term, by the way, for scholarships and grants, which means they cannot talk about, can't basically lump in there, loans or work programs, which is obviously what you want to know about the most is the grants and the scholarships. So when you're talking to them, you need to be using the right terminology. Now, when it comes to grants and scholarships, grants are typically given out based on filling out the financial aid forms. Scholarships are typically be, be given out based on academic 
as far as GPA, SAT scores, achievements, community service, et cetera. So while these two things are free money, they're given out for very different reasons. And by the way, the financial aid office handles all financial aid forms. They handle all grants. The admissions office handles all admissions. That means they handle all scholarship money. So the two different departments handle two different sides of the financial aid stuff, which then brings us to how do you qualify for financial aid? Basically, how do you qualify for grants, essentially, here in the world of financial aid, the free stuff? Now, right off the bat, this year here, the chart you see here is essentially how every college determines if you're eligible for financial assistance of really any kind. Here. Now, the first part here is called cost of attendance. Cost of attendance is what school costs everything included for one academic year. I'm going to show you what goes into that in the next slide. What you want to subtract out of that is what your expected family contribution is. What they're going to be calling that next year is going to be the student aid index, but it's the same thing. The expected family contribution number and the student aid index, this number will be given to you the moment you guys fill out the FAFSA forms. You guys can also go online too if you want to know what your number is before you fill out the forms and just on Google, just type in EFC calculator and it'll show you a calculator where you can actually figure out your expected family contribution, i.e. your student aid index. These two numbers, the, financial, the student aid index as well as the expected family contribution number, these two numbers here are what they expect you can pay for one academic year for one student going off to college. So you take the cost of attendance, subtract out what they think you can pay for one academic year. What's left over is your financial need, what the college should help you out with in scholarships, grants, loans, and work study. The reason I say they should is there's no guideline, there's no law saying they have to help you with the entire amount. As you go through this process, you're going to notice which schools are generous and which schools are not generous at all, unfortunately. Now, let me go to the next page here. And let's talk about what goes into the cost of attendance. Cost of attendance is essentially everything it costs for one year to attend that college, which are both direct cost, which you pay directly to the college, which are tuition, fees, room and board, and indirect costs that you pay for going off to college, which do not get paid directly to the college, which are books, supplies, transportation, laptop, those kind of things. Now, the reason you ask the school for the cost of attendance, and by the way, every school is supposed to give you the, the cost of attendance by law. So if you ask them for them, they can at least give you this year's cost, the 22-23 academic year. And they can just take that number and basically increase it by 5%. That'll give you an idea of what your numbers will look like for seniors here. For juniors, you basically put two increases because there'll be two increases for juniors. Now, the way it works is the cost of attendance incorporates everything. So this is the best thing to know because it'll allow you to know the total cost of the university. Most schools have this cost, by the way, on their admissions page. If they don't, if you call them, they can provide it to you. Now, that brings us to the most important thing of the entire night here, which every family should be utilizing, and that's the net price calculator. Now, the net price calculator is essentially a honed in version of doing the expected family calculator. And before I told you guys, if you wanted to figure out how much the colleges think you can pay towards college, you guys can go on Google and just type in EFC calculator, and it gives you a broad number of what every college thinks you guys can pay for college. If you guys go to the same, same route, go to Google, type in the school's name and the term net price calculator, it will basically bring you in most cases here to College Board to their net price calculator. The net price calculator will specifically tell you guys for that school, based on your financial situation, how much they can give you in grants, in a lot of cases, in scholarship money. So the net price calculator, most of them, by the way, only ask you like 10, 15 questions. They're very quick, very easy. These are the keys to figuring out, are your colleges for your specific situation going to be generous or not? And adding to that, you can, as basically I can show you guys here, I just went on Google and I did a net price calculator for Harvard, just to show you guys how they work. Harvard, by the way, costs $81,000 a year. I plugged into Harvard's questions. They only had 12 questions, very simple, very direct after I Googled it. They came out and said for a family of four, and I put in, we make $100,000 a year and we have one student going off to college and we have $50,000 investments as far as investments, as far as cash, savings, uh, nothing in retirement. I put that in there. And Harvard came back and said, you will only be paying $8,000 to attend our university, which obviously means Harvard's going to provide essentially $73,000 of financial assistance, grant money, free money. I don't have to pay that. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, that's great, Ed, but how many of us are really going off to Harvard? And the reason I use Harvard is because everyone knows Harvard. 
But the reality is Harvard's not the only school this generous. Ithaca, Case Western, Providence, extremely generous. Gettysburg, Muhlenberg, Franklin and Marshall, Bucknell, extremely generous. Boston University, NY, uh, Northeastern, Columbia, Cornell. It's not just the high guys either, the top guys. Loyola, all four Loyolas are very generous. So is Fairleigh Dickinson here in New Jersey. So is Seton Hall. So is uh, Centenary in Fairfield. A lot of these colleges out there, they don't have to be name brand, top tier, most difficult schools to get into, are crazy generous. The way you would know that is if you did their net price calculator, by the way. Okay, Which brings us to the financial aid form. Let's talk about the financial aid forms here. Now, when it comes to financial aid forms, obviously, they become available in senior year starting October 1st. The form on the left, the FAFSA form, will be filled out by all of you. All of you here tonight will fill out the FAFSA form, no matter what your situation is. If you're not sure why you're filling it out, because you have too much income or too much assets, etc., I have a specific video on the YouTube channel, the seven reasons why everyone fills the FAFSA. So just watch that video. It's about seven or eight minutes long. explains all the different reasons why you fill out the FAFSA form, no matter what your financial situation is. So all of you will do the form on the left. The form on the right is called the CSS profile, which is an additional form some of you will fill out, not all of you. Now, we're going to start with the FAFSA form here. Now, when it comes to the FAFSA form, this is the new website you guys will be using because the FAFSA form changed their website the last couple of months. So going forward, instead of going to the fafsa.ed.gov site, you guys will go, as you see down there, the studentaid.gov site. Now, when you're filling out the form here on studentaid.gov, you guys will need to obtain two IDs. This is very important. One ID for the parent, one ID for the student. The way it works is if you click on the start here button or the login button, either for a new student or returning the student, by the way, the next page, believe it or not, is the same exact page. So it doesn't matter which one you type, which one you click on, by the way. The next page that will ask you, do you have your FS aid IDs, also known as the FAFSA IDs? The FAFSA IDs, the FSA IDs are used per individual, one for the student and one for the parent. The student's ID is used to start the form. So you, you basically go create the ID and you start the form. The second ID is the parent's ID used to sign and also upload your taxes from the IRS halfway through the student's form. So you guys need two IDs, one for the student to start the form, one for the parent to sign in, sorry, to sign the form at the end as well as upload your taxes. Whether you click on the start here button or the login button, they're both going to ask you the same thing. Do you have the ID? If you don't, let's create one. So it's impossible to miss this step, by the way. Also, if you need help with this, I do have, as you can see here, one of the videos I have is the step-by-step -step guide on the YouTube channel to create your FSA IDs for your student as well as for the parent. Now, once again, both IDs and the FAFSA form is started and created on the studentaid.gov site, okay? You need to both IDs. Reason why is because halfway through the FAFSA, using the parent's ID, you guys, as you can see here, will be able to, as you see at the bottom, link your taxes from the IRS to the FAFSA form. This is why you guys need to do the two IDs. First ID, start the form. Second ID, upload your taxes, and then both IDs are used at the end of the FAFSA to sign your FAFSA forms, okay? What counts in the FAFSA and what doesn't count in the FAFSA? Right at the bat, your primary home does not count on the FAFSA form. Your primary home, where you live, is not asked for on the FAFSA as far as your equity. What also does not count is your retirement assets as far as your 401ks, your IRAs, your Roths, and so on and so forth, your 403bs. These do not go on the FAFSA form. There is one question in the FAFSA form is where the issue pops up. The one question will ask you, how much did you contribute to your retirement account last year? That question is asking you how much you put into your 401k last year. So if you put in 4,000 and you have 100,000 in your 401k total, you don't put on the FAFSA, you have 100k. You put on the FAFSA, the thousand, the 4,000 bucks you put into the 401k, that's it. So your contribution, not your total here, okay? Now, when it comes to the FAFSA form, they will count your checking, your savings, your investments outside of retirement. They're also gonna count any second property you have, rental properties or land or these kind of items. Anything secondary option as far as property counts. Now, what they will not count is your business. If you have less than 100 employees, so if you have 100 employees or less, they will not count your business here. So 
obviously you have 10 employees, 20 employees, you have a couple of trucks and inventory. None of your company here counts, by the way. Okay. Now, when it comes to 529 plans, the college savings plans, what does count is basically any college savings you have. UTMAs, UGMAs, 529s, the four benefits, uh, the principles for benefit programs, all of these things, the state plans, the uh, NJ Best, all of these things count when it comes to the, the FAFSA form. Now, you put all the college savings assets, if the parent is the principal and the student's a beneficiary, in this parent section of the financial aid forms. If the grandparent, the uncle, the aunt, et cetera, have, are the principal of that asset, the 529 plan, your student's a beneficiary, these plans do not count. The only count is if the student is, sorry, if the parent is the principal. If anybody else is the principal, you do not put these things on here because it doesn't belong to the beneficiary. So if your student's a beneficiary, it's not their 529. It's the other person, the principal, the grandparents 529. And on the FAFSA, there's no section for grand, uh, grandparent assets or uncles or aunts. So these, these uh, accounts do not go on these forms, by the way, okay? Which brings us to the tax year. When you're doing the tax information, they're gonna ask you for the adjusted gross income. That's the income they're looking at for the, uh, for the tax, which is line 11, by the way, on your tax returns for 2021, okay? Let's see here, let's go to the next page here, and I'll address this here. Let's go over the expected family contribution, also known as the student aid index. This here specifically will show you guys how the colleges calculate how much money you should be paying towards college based on your income and assets, both student and parent. There's four parts to this. I'm going to go through this. You don't have to do this exactly this way, by the way, because you guys can just Google expected family contribution or student aid indexes calculator as well. But I go through it to show you guys how they come up with your numbers. Starting from the bottom and working way way out. Student assets. Any money in the student's name, they want 20% of it right at the top to go towards the cost of college. So if you put on here, your student has, let's say, $1,000 in a checking account. Right at the back, 20% of that, or 200 bucks is going to count as part one of the four parts they add together of how much you can pay towards cost of college. Part number two, students' income. Students are allowed to make up to $7,600. That means that they made less than $7,600. None of it counts. If they made anything over $7,600, every dollar over that amount counts at 50 cents on the dollar. So they do tax the student pretty heavily when it comes to paying for the college cost. Part number three, Parents' assets. Remember, one, once again, your primary home doesn't count. Your retirement assets do not count. So everything else, your checking, your savings, investments outside of retirement, secondary homes, et cetera, that's what they're talking about here. They count all those assets starting at 5.6% because there's no more asset protection anymore, okay? And that brings us to part number four, parents' income. When it comes to parents' income, it's basically a sliding scale. The more that you make, the more they expect you to pay towards the cost of college. Now, you're probably wondering, are we in the 20%? Are we in the 45%? How does this work? Once again, they're looking at your adjusted gross income. Now, when it comes to your adjusted gross income, for families that have an income of 50,000 to 200,000, 50 grand to 200 grand, they're looking at you guys to pay roughly 22% of your income. Once you go over the 22, uh, 200,000, you guys are in that boat where they start increasing the percentages. Now, if you want to figure out what your number is, obviously just go on Google and do the EFC calculators, or even better yet, do the net price calculators that are specific to the colleges you guys are considering. Because they add these four parts together, and that's how they come up with your expected family contribution, the amount they expect you to pay towards the cost of college. Now, when it comes to the FAFSA, once you finish the FAFSA, you're going to see this page right here. At the end of the FAFSA form, you're going to see two boxes. On the two boxes, one of the most important boxes on the left will be, you will see that they're gonna ask you, do you wanna submit the state required forms? And the answer obviously is yes. Whether you're staying in the state of New Jersey or not, you wanna click on this form, on this box. This will just basically send your FAFSA information right over to the state of New Jersey. There's nothing else you have to do. It's very simple, but it can only be done once. At the end of the FAFSA form on the confirmation page, they give you the link to click on to send it over. If you do not click on that, you can't go back in and do it again, by the way. You can go onto the HESA site, HESA.org site, create an account, and then do that, basically fill out their forms. But if you just click on that box, it's so much easier because there's no other questions to answer. They just transfer all your information over for you guys, making it very simple. Which brings us to 
if you are eligible for state aid, or essentially if you're all look, are looking at the Scarlet Guarantee or the other guaranteed programs from the state of New Jersey, you have to make sure you click on that box because it creates your HESA account, which also then allows you, because in about a month or two later, they're going to send you information about creating your NJ FAMS account. Now, once you create NJ FAMS, and by the way, you should be doing this if you're looking to stay in the state. Once you get that notification saying we have your information here at the state of New Jersey, i.e. HESA, can you please create your NJ FAMS account? Your NJ FAMS account is created by your student. Once they create the account, very simple questions, name, address, so on and so forth, username, password, you can go, once you log in, you see this specific page. Once you log in as a student, you want to click on the to-do list to see, do they need anything from us? Sometimes they need a driver's license. Sometimes they ask for a, a W-2, just randomly small stuff, nothing that big. You want to make sure to do this because this site here makes you eligible for state aid which is EOF, Education Opportunity Programs, as well as Urban Scholars Programs, as well as grants and scholarships and all kinds of good stuff from the state of New Jersey. The state of New Jersey, by the way, can provide up to over $13,000 of grant money if you stay in the state of New Jersey and are eligible based on your financial situation. So you obviously want to do this and you don't want to miss clicking on the to-do list just in case you're missing anything. That being said, let's jump right into the Scarlet Guarantee, a great program from the state of New Jersey that I myself uh, have been applauding since it came out about six, seven months ago. Because most of the time, New Jersey, unfortunately, our state schools, Rutgers was one of the most expensive state schools for any state out there. But with this program, it's game changing. The way this works is very simple. Fill out the FAFSA form, fill out the state form before April 1st, 2023. As long as you fill out the form before that and you meet these requirements, you get huge discounts from Rutgers. I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. If your adjusted gross income is between $80,000 to $100,000, the tuition for Rutgers is just $5,000, which is basically a 75 to 80% reduction. If your adjusted gross income is $65,000 to $80,000, you're talking about three grand which is basically around an 85% reduction. Income adjusted gross is 65 below, you're not paying anything you're paying zero tuition costs for one, which means this is a huge cost savings for a lot of families out there. So if you're eligible for a scholar guarantee and you're applying, you got to make sure to get the forms in, the FAFSA and the state form before the April 1st deadline. You don't want to miss this. Obviously, this is going to make it a lot more competitive for Rutgers to get in. So for applications and admissions, you also don't want to be late with this. You want to get your Rutgers application in the latest, I would say, the end of October. I would not be waiting longer than that, whether you're doing early action or regular or priority deadline, because of the fact that this is going to throw in a lot more competition to getting into Rutgers, by the way. Very good for the admissions, for the, sorry, for the financial aid side, but a lot more competition. Now let's talk about the next form you guys will be looking to fill out, which is the CSS profile form. The CSS profile form is filled out by some colleges, not all of them. If you want to figure out, do I have to do the FAFSA and the CSS, or do I just have to do the, the FAFSA form that's it? Very simple. Number one, call the school's financial aid office and ask them, which financial aid forms do you need and when do you need them by? Or number two, go right here to College Board. On College Board, this right here, this, the account your students set up for the SATs and their PSATs, as well as their AP classes and everything else, here is where you guys can go to fill out the CSS profile form. So if you go on here, it will actually show you a list of every school that requires a CSS profile and which schools do not, obviously the ones that are not on that list. So if you don't see your school on here, you don't have to fill it out. Now, when you're filling out the CSS profile form, it's vastly different than the FAFSA form. Right at the bat, both forms use your 21 tax information, but there are big differences. Right at the bat, FAFSA form, 50, 60 questions. CSS profile starting, 400 starting questions, believe it or not. So a lot more questions. They want to know about your retirement assets. They want to know about your house, when you bought it, how much it's worth, how much you owe, how much you pay each month. They go very in-depth with their questions. So if you have to fill out both forms, because the school requires both forms, it's the only way of getting financial aid from them, by the way, so you can't just do one to get financial assistance. If you have to fill out both forms and you get overwhelmed, there are save buttons on both forms. Do not rush. Hit the save button and then come back. Do not rush. There's no need to rush here. You have plenty of time to get this thing done. I've had parents tell me they've spent two, three days filling out this form, which is not obviously ideal, but you can take your time. Do not rush through this. If you're uncertain about a, an answer to a question, just leave it blank or put zero if you have to put something in there. But don't just wildly guess numbers. 
that's where the big issues happen, specifically for the CSS profile, because it's so much more in depth when it comes to the questions, okay? Which brings us to the divorce situation, the married situation, remarried, separated, et cetera. When it comes to the world of college, the FAFSA form, so on and so forth, when you're talking about filling out the form, the FAFSA form will at some point in time, usually within about 15 questions, ask you the parent's marital status. Once you indicate the parent is divorced or separated, it's automatically going to ask you guys, who does a student live with 51% of the time or more? That's the standard question they've had in the past. We haven't heard yet. It's going to change yet, but it is in the wind out there that they're going to change it to who claimed the student. But until they do that, hopefully they don't, because obviously you get to choose if you say which, where, where the student lives 51% of the time or more. It's more beneficial for you guys to be able to choose which parent you want to use. Now, once you indicate that they live with mom or they live with dad, whoever it may be, that automatically erases the questions for the other parent. They're not going to be asked these questions about income or assets. Now, we're still kind of in a holding pattern to see which one they're going to choose, but that's where we are right now. They're either going to, A, in the past, like they haven't before, let you choose which parent you want to use, or B, it's going to be the parent that claims a student going forward they have indicated they want to use the iris indication the iris the definition of it which is who claims the student on taxes so kind of holding pattern here but hopefully they'll give us information about this soon enough now let's just say that you are married or if you're remarried if you're remarried stepmom stepdads etc your information goes on all these forms fafsa and css they want to know about all your information unfortunately so whether you've been married a day, a week, 10 years, whether you, you adopted a student, whether you didn't, whether you support the student or not, the schools do not care. If you're remarried, the step parent information goes on the forms. Unfortunately, it's just the way the system works, which brings us to the multiple students in college and how it works on the financial aid. When it comes to multiple students in college, the way it works is very simple. In the past, the FAFSA form, because this year they're changing it, as I mentioned before, in the past, the FAFSA form would basically say, if you had one student going to college and you were paying X amount of dollars and then you had a second student going to college or two at the same time, you are still paying the same amount of, in, uh, of assets income-wise towards the cost of college. Let me explain to you how it works. So student one went off to college. You fill out the FAFSA form. The FAFSA form says you guys can pay 20,000. The school costs 35,000 a year, which means you have 15,000 of financial aid space here. Then year two comes around or the same year, you have two students going to college. Fill out both their FAFSA forms because the FAFSA forms, by the way, are student specific. So if you have two students going off, you're filling out two FAFSAs. For these two students, they both went to, let's say, $35,000 colleges just to make the math easy, obviously. Doesn't mean they have to go to the same school because they don't. What would happen is you were still looked upon to pay the same $20,000. Only difference is you're paying $10,000 for student one and $10,000 for student two. That's the way they would work this, by the way. Okay? which basically means you had more financial aid space for each student specifically. The FAFSA form is getting rid of that. So whether you have one student in school or two or three, and that one student said you can pay 20, you're paying student one 20,000 plus student two 20,000 and so on and so forth. Now, obviously this is a big deal for a lot of families out there, especially looking at FAFSA only schools, but the reality is it's not that big of a deal because what did not change was the school's way of doing this because there's three people giving you financial aid, by the way the federal government, the state, and the college. The college, by the way, is the one that gives out the most financial assistance for need based on you individually as far as a family concern. The FAFSA form, typically for this kind of situation, if you had an income of, let's call it 70,000 or more, the FAFSA form would not give you any grant money anyways. Even if you had two kids in college at 70,000 or above, the FAFSA would give you like $1,200 each student. So the reality is, the FAFSA doesn't affect you as much as many people think it does. It's not beneficial, obviously, but it's the school you need to figure out. How generous are they? Because most of the generous colleges I talked about in the beginning, the $70,000, $80,000 very expensive schools, they give out a ton of money. They're not following this format of not counting multiple students in school. They're going to follow it, which means they give you guys more discounts. So obviously doing the net price calculators are very important for you guys, which brings us to frequently made errors on the financial aid forms. The top four errors every year are very simple. These are the ones you have to avoid. First name, last name, social, and birthday. If you can avoid these four errors, you guys are golden. These are the four errors that delay everything. The rest of the errors, as far as you put the wrong address, or wrong email, those don't matter. It's these four that will stop the FAFSA form from being processed, as well as CSS profile and the Common App and everything else from being processed. So you want to make sure first name, last name, social, and birthday are correct and you're fine. 
going forward as far as the errors on the forms are concerned. Which brings us to the scams, the pitfalls, and the things you guys need to avoid. When it comes to scams, there's a lot of them out there. And now with the student loan forgiveness stuff and everything else, there's even more scams out there. So I tell parents all the time, this is the website you need to go to, to know everything out there and to avoid it. If you look down below, studentaid.gov resources slash scams, I have a link if you guys want to take a screenshot here of the website you guys should go to, which will explain all the different scams and frauds out there, scholarship fraud, uh, grant fraud, student loan frauds and scams, so you guys can help avoid it. One of the best things the U.S. Department of Education does is helping you guys avoid the scams and frauds, believe it or not. This website here also has a phone number you can call to see if you've already done something, if you've been scammed or not. So if I were you guys, I would definitely be going here. It's a great website, great place to go to avoid these issues. Which brings us to after the financial aid forms are in, after your admissions forms are in, you guys will start receiving these right here called the financial aid award letters. The financial aid award letters are essentially what the school is willing to offer you to attend that university. Now, once you get the financial aid award letters, this is when you guys can start appealing. I guess negotiating is what a lot of people call it nowadays, where you guys can ask more money, basically. Now, the way negotiations work is very simple. Once you have the first letter showing you guys what you guys have been offered from the college you want to go to. If you've been accepted to another college and they're offering you more grants and scholarships, very simple. You go back to school A and say, this is where we want to go. This is the school of our choice, number one school. We just want to make you aware that you guys gave us a $10,000 grant or scholarship. But school B here, another school we're considering, is giving us $20,000 in grants and scholarships. Can you guys match the $20,000 number? That's what you want to do. You want to start, by the way, with can you match it? You never go in there going, can we split the difference? You want to see first what they come back with when you say, can you guys match the number? That's the goal here. If they can match the number, obviously, then you guys are golden. If they can't, the other aspect is they might come back and say, we can't match the number, but can we meet in the middle at 15,000? That's why you don't want to meet in the middle to begin with, because you might kind of undercut yourself without even realizing it. Okay. Now I tell parents all the time, you need to negotiate with all the colleges you're interested in, specifically the top three. So if you're applying to 15 schools, you don't negotiate with 15 schools. You're just wasting everybody's time because you're not going to 15 colleges. You negotiate with your top three schools to see what they can do to maximize the aid before you start. That's the goal is always to maximize the aid before you start the college, okay? Which brings us to student loan options for you guys. Now, right at the top, once you guys fill out the FAFSA form, your students are automatically eligible for federal student loans of $5,500. For most of you guys out there, the student loans are breaking into two categories. Just by filling out the FAFSA, they automatically offer them loans. They don't have to take it, but they offer it to them. Of the $5,500, 3,500 of it is interest-free because it's subsidized. The government's paying the interest on that loan for your student. The other 2,000 of the 5,500 is unsubsidized, which means the interest is growing on that loan. You can elect to take both loans or say no to both loans or just say yes to the interest-free loan. It's up to you. The federal direct loans are only in the student's name, so the parent has nothing to do with them. They're paid back six months after the student graduates over a 10-year standard repayment. They can actually extend the loan payments, believe it or not, to almost over 25 years in many cases if there's any hardships or issues through using deferments or forbearance or hardships to be able to keep extending the loan out for you guys, just in case there's anything financially issue-wise you guys are dealing with. Then, of course, the next level, if 5,500 is not enough, you guys also have Parent PLUS loans available through the U.S. Department of Education. Now, Parent PLUS loans are probably the last place I'm looking to go for loans, by the way, because Parent PLUS loans have an interest rate of over 7.5%, so very high, even for the environment we find ourselves in. So I would be looking at, instead of the private lenders, by the way, if you guys are looking for loans, I would be looking at New Jersey class loans right now, because they have interest rates starting at 2.99%, the cheapest options out there. Now, when it comes to student loans, by the way, you guys don't apply for any student loans, by the way, until July. So until your students are accepted, going to college, you deposited everything else, basically a month before you guys are sending them off over there, that's when you guys do the loan stuff. Because the loans basically have a 90-day credit window. So if you apply for the loan too early, they expire. Kind of like the same thing with the mortgage. You get pre-approved. You got 90 days to find a house and close. Same thing with the student loans. You want to do this in July at the earliest, no earlier than that, or else the loan will basically expire. Which brings us to our newsletter. Our newsletter goes out every month. 
some of you already signed up for the newsletter through the uh, pre uh, through the registration for the app for the Zoom meeting here. If you didn't, we have newsletter that goes out for seniors, for juniors, etc. If you want to know exactly what to do every month, just sign up for our newsletter. I'll give you my email address at the end here. Send me an email, and I'll basically uh, send you guys a newsletter every month talking about everything. We talk about admissions, financial aid. We talk about testing. We talk about the whole gamut here. So if you want the newsletter, just sign up for it, and I'll send it out to you guys via email, as well as let's talk about the important links here today. As far as the important links here today, obviously, the College Board is the number one important website here for you guys as far as information, everything else, as well as you also have finaid.com and capex.com. These are the two scholarship searches I like the most, by the way. These two here are free scholarship searches, nothing you need to pay for. And of course, we do have the YouTube channel. If you guys want more content, more information, I have a lot of videos on there. I'm actually posting three more videos just this week from questions you guys have given me in different presentations I've already done. So if you're looking for anything on the video side, just email me, hey, Ed, can you do a video about X, Y, and Z? I typically knock out the video in about a, a week or two and send it out to you guys. As well as, if you guys need help in the entire process, whatever it may be, financial aid, admissions, if you need help filling out the financial aid forms, I do help parents fill out the financial aid forms. Or if you just have questions, on the screen is my contact information. That's actually my cell phone number, believe it or not. So if you need help, need questions, answered, so on and so forth, just text me. Texting me, by the way, is the fastest way to reach me. It's the easiest way to reach me if you text me because I can answer text messages all day long. Email is the second fastest way to reach me. And then if you call me, I rarely have ever answer the phone, by the way, because I just don't have time. This year I'm doing, I think it's 82 high school presentations. So it's very rare to get me on the phone. So if you text me though, I can answer all your questions very quickly, okay? And that being said, that's the end of the presentation, guys. 